Welcome to Alexandria, where history unfolds one chapter at a time. In Chapter 12, The Sabine War, we witness Romulus's prowess and strategic mind as he leads Rome through a series of critical confrontations, setting the stage for the city's expansion and the shaping of its foreign policy. Following a victory over Akron and the capture of Canina, Romulus showcases not only his military might, but also his diplomatic acumen, extending an olive branch to the conquered, inviting them to join Rome as allies. His victories pave the way for Rome's growth, with Crustuminium and Antemne soon joining the burgeoning empire. But as tensions with the Sabines escalate, Romulus gears Rome for defense, leading to days of fierce combat. In a remarkable turn of events, it is the Sabine women, once the center of conflict, who pave the way for peace. Their intervention leads to a historic treaty, merging Romans and Sabines into a united nation. Subscribe to Alexandria to continue exploring the gripping tales of Rome's foundation, like to honor our shared heritage and share to keep the legacy of the past alive. Now, let us march into the Sabine War and witness the events that forge a city's destiny. Chapter 12, The Sabine War, B.C. 750-746 While the negotiations with the Sabines were still pending, Romulus faced another problem. This problem was a war that started suddenly because a neighboring leader named Akron invaded Roman territories. Akron was the ruler of a small state with a capital called Sienina. This Sinina is believed to have been just four or five miles away from Romulus's city. This clearly demonstrates how small the scale of the deeds and exploits related to the initial establishment of the great empire was. Although these actions were initially insignificant in themselves, they had tremendous consequences that followed. Akron was a brave, energetic, and determined man. He had already gained a lot of fame through his military achievements. He had been closely monitoring the development of the new colony with suspicion. He believed that if it was allowed to establish and expand, it could potentially become a strong adversary in the future, posing a threat to both him and the other states in that region of Italy. He really wanted to attack the new city, so when he heard about the capture of the Sabine women, he saw it as the perfect opportunity. He convinced the Sabines to immediately declare war on the Romans and promised to help them with all his available forces. The Sabines, however, didn't want to resort to extreme measures. They spent a lot of time negotiating and sending envoys. But Akron became completely fed up with the delays and decided to take matters into his own hands by wiping out the new colony all by himself. So he formed a rough and partially organized army and moved towards Rome. Romulus, who had been told about his intentions and preparations, went out to confront him. The two armies saw each other on a plain near the city. Romulus led his troops, while Akron also appeared at the front of the invaders. After expressing their challenges and defiance in front of each other and their armies, it was finally agreed that the dispute would be settled through a one-on-one -on -one fight, with the two commanders themselves as the champions. Romulus and Akron then stepped forward to the center of the field while their armies surrounded them, creating a ring for the combatants to engage in. The meeting between the warriors was even more interesting because they looked very different. Romulus, who was young and tall, had a soft and delicate face that showed his youthfulness. Akron, on the other hand, was a seasoned soldier, tough, resilient, and stern and the crowds of military spectators that surrounded the field, when they saw the fighters as they approached to engage, expected a very uneven battle. Romulus, however, emerged as the winner. Before entering the battle, he made a promise to Jupiter that if he defeated his enemy, he would credit the god for all the glory of the victory, and he would display Akron's weapons and spoils in Rome as a sacred trophy to Jupiter, in recognition of the divine assistance that led to the conquest. According to the old historians, Romulus won the fight because of this promise. In any case, he did win. 
Akron was killed, and while Romulus was taking off Akron's armor, his men were chasing Akron's army. The soldiers ran back to their city in fear when they saw that their king had lost the one-on-one -on -one fight. Canina was easily captured because it couldn't defend itself. Once Romulus had control of the city, he gathered the inhabitants and reassured them that he had no ill intentions towards them. However, he wanted them to be his allies and friends. He made a promise to them that if they left Canina and joined him in Rome, they would be treated like brothers and become part of the Roman state. They would also enjoy all the benefits of being Roman citizens. The people of Canina were initially terrified and distressed when they were captured by their enemies. However, they were eventually transferred to Rome, which helped increase the population, strength, and reputation of the city. This also made Romulus more famous in the eyes of neighboring nations. This triumph over Akron and the addition of his territories to the Roman Empire are seen as highly significant in history. They serve as the model for the Roman state's foreign policy, which was characterized by bravery and vigor in military operations, as well as fairness towards the defeated. This policy was so effective that it allowed the Roman power to expand from one kingdom to another and from one continent to another until it almost spanned the entire world. Romulus kept his promise to Jupiter. When the army returned to Rome, the soldiers followed his instructions and cut down a small oak tree. They trimmed the branches at the top and shortened them as needed. Then they hung Akron's weapons and armor on the tree and proudly marched into the city with it. Romulus walked in the middle of the procession, wearing a crown of laurel on his head and his long hair flowing down his shoulders. The victorious group entered the city while being cheered on by the gathered crowd of men, women, and children. They had gathered at the gates and on the rooftops of houses, shouting and applauding the procession along the way. After the long parade, tables were set up in the streets and public squares for the soldiers to eat. The entire day was spent celebrating and being happy. This was the very first Roman triumph, which served as the inspiration for the grand and impressive spectacles that amazed people in later times. The treasures that were brought in on the oak were placed on a hill in the city as a trophy for Jupiter. A small temple was built specifically to house them. This temple was very small, measuring only five feet wide and ten feet long. Shortly after these events, two more cities were added to the Roman state. These cities were called Crustuminium and Antemnae. Some women from these cities were captured in Rome during the abduction of the Sabine women, and the people of these cities had been planning their revenge ever since. They were not strong enough to fight Romulus directly, but they started to attack Roman territories with small groups of armed men that they were able to gather. Romulus quickly gathered troops and unexpectedly attacked the city's walls, capturing them before the residents could react. He then sent a message to all the women in Rome who used to live in those cities. He asked them to come and see him in a public place in the city, along with the Roman Senate. The women were very scared when they received this summons. They thought that they would be punished with death or something else terrible for the wrongs done by their fellow countrymen. They entered the Senate House, covering their faces with their robes and crying out with sadness and fear. Romulus told them not to worry and assured them that he didn't want to harm them. He said that their people chose war instead of being friends and allies with them, and they lost the war. Now we have them and can do whatever we want with them. But we don't want to hurt them. We forgive them because of you. We plan to ask them to come and live with us and with you in Rome so that you can be happy again by being with your fathers, brothers, and husbands. We won't destroy or harm their cities. Instead, we'll send some of our own citizens to live there so they can become part of the Roman community. This way, your fathers, brothers, and all your fellow countrymen can enjoy life, freedom, and happiness because of you. All we ask in return is for you to remain loving and loyal to your Roman husbands and do your best to contribute to the harmony and happiness of the city in any way you can. These transactions gained a lot of attention across the country. 
People praised Romulus for his bravery when he faced his enemies and for his generosity when he allowed them to join him in an honorable alliance after they surrendered. Actually, a strong public sentiment in favor of the new colony started to form, and many individual adventurers from all parts of the country rapidly started to come to it. In one case, a well-known leader named Kellius, who was a general of the Etrurians living north of the Tiber, brought his entire army to join the new colony. New and special arrangements had to be made in Rome to accommodate the sudden and significant increase in the population. As a result, a new area, previously located outside the city, was enclosed and included within the city limits. This hill was named Celius, after the general whose army occupied it. At the same time, the city also expanded on the opposite side towards the Tiber. The walls were extended all the way to the riverbank and then continued along the bank to provide continuous defense on that side, except for one area where there was a large gate leading to the water. Throughout this period, however, the Sabines still held on to feelings of anger and hostility. Instead of being won over by the Romans' patience and kindness, they only became more jealous and resentful when they saw evidence of the Romans' growing influence and power. They worked on their plans to attack the new colony. They wanted to make sure their attack was successful, so they took their time to prepare and plan everything carefully. They recruited soldiers, they gathered supplies and weapons, they made alliances with neighboring states who supported their cause, and when everything was prepared, they gathered their troops at the border and got ready to attack. The leader of this large army was named Titus Tadius. In the meantime, Romulus and the people of the city were busy getting ready to defend themselves. They gathered and stored lots of food for the city. They made the walls stronger and longer and built new walls and towers where they were needed. Numitor helped his grandson by sending weapons and military equipment that were used in those times to attack and defend cities. Both sides were preparing a lot for a determined and intense fight. When everything was ready, the Sabines, before actually attacking as they had planned for a long time, decided to send one more message to Romulus to ask for the women to be given up. This, of course, was just a matter of appearance, as they probably knew from past events that Romulus would not agree to such a suggestion. He did not agree. In response to their request, he sent word that the Sabine women were already living happily in Rome with their husbands and friends, and he couldn't consider disturbing them now. After receiving this response, the Sabines prepared for the attack. There was a specific area of land around Rome that belonged to the people of the city and was farmed by them, they used this land for both farming and raising cattle, but mainly for raising cattle because it was a more beneficial way to get food for people in old times compared to farming the land. The rural population of the Roman territory was mainly made up of herdsmen. When the threat from the Sabines became serious, Romulus gathered all these herdsmen and instructed them to bring their flocks of sheep and herds of cattle to the back of the city. They were then confined in an enclosed area for easier defense. So the Sabine army realized that the Roman territory on that side was empty and quiet when they were about to enter it. They noticed that there was no resistance as they advanced towards the gates of Rome. They moved forward as planned, and when they reached the city, they discovered that Romulus had captured two hills outside the walls, he had fortified himself with a strong force on these two hills, which were called the Escaline and Quirinal Hills. The city had two other hills, the Palatine and the Capitoline. The Capitoline Hill used to have an asylum and now served as a citadel. The citadel was protected by ramparts and towers that provided a view and control over the surrounding area. The fortress was commanded by Tarpeius, a noble Roman, he had a daughter named Tarpaia, whose name later became famous in history because of her involvement in the events of this siege, as will be explained soon. At the bottom of the Capitoline Hill, on the western side, away from the city, there was a large plain. This plain was later incorporated into the city and used as a parade ground called the Campus Martius, 
which means war field. This area was now, however, a flat and open land, and the Sabine army moved forward to it and set up camp. The Sabine forces were much larger than the Roman forces, but the Romans were well defended and protected by their walls and fortifications. Titus Tatius realized that there was no practical way to attack them with any chance of success. Finally, one day, while some officers were walking around the Capitoline Hill, observing the walls of the citadel, Tarpeia approached one of the gates, which was in a quiet and isolated spot, and started a conversation with the men. The story of what happened next is told differently by different historians, and it is now hard to know the real truth about it. The story goes like this. Tarpeia saw the soldiers from the walls and noticed the bracelets and rings they were wearing. She then made a deal with the Sabines that she would open the gate at night and let them in, in exchange for the ornaments she was interested in. The Sabines agreed to do this and then left. Titus Tadius, upon hearing about this, ordered a strong group of soldiers to quietly and secretly go to the designated gate at night. Some writers claim that Tarpeia's apparent betrayal was actually a clever plan to trap the Sabines. They say that she informed Romulus about the agreement so that he could secretly send a strong force to the gate and capture the Sabine group when they arrived. But if this was Tarpeia's plan, it completely failed. The Sabines, when they arrived at the postern gate that Tarpeia opened for them at midnight, came with enough strength to overcome any resistance. And as they had promised to give Tarpeia what they were wearing on their arms, they threw their heavy shields on her until she was crushed and killed. A steep rock on the side of the Capitoline Hill is known as the Tarpeian Rock, named after the maiden. Even today, the Sabines took control of the citadel while Romulus still held the main city. The Romans were very upset about losing the citadel. Romulus realized the danger and decided to stop defending and instead face the Sabines on the plain for a battle. He then moved his forces out of the city and positioned them strongly between the Capitoline and Palatine hills, facing the Campus Martius, where the main Sabine army was stationed. In this way, the two armies faced each other on the plain. The Romans had the city and the Palatine Hill as a secure fallback option, while the Sabines had the Capitoline Hill and the Citadel for refuge. In this situation, there were a number of intense but incomplete fights that happened for several days. Eventually, a big battle took place. Throughout this time, people gathered on the walls of the city and the citadel to watch the fights. They had climbed up to see the battles because, from these walls and the slopes of the hills, they could see the entire plain below as if it were a map. The fight went on all day. By evening, both sides were tired, and there were many dead and injured on the field. However, no one had won. The next day, they agreed to stop fighting to tend to the wounded and bury the dead. After a day of rest, spent by both sides clearing the battlefield and preparing for the next round of fighting, the battle resumed. The soldiers fought with even greater intensity and brutality than before. Several events happened during the day to give either party a local or temporary advantage, but neither side completely won. At one point, Romulus himself was in serious danger, and for a while, it was believed that he was actually killed. The Romans had a big advantage over a group of the Sabines, and the Sabines were running away to the citadel. The Romans were chasing them and hoping to enter the citadel too, taking advantage of the chaos and regain control of the fortress. To stop this, the Sabines inside the fortress and on the higher rocks threw stones down at the Romans. One of these stones hit Romulus on the head, and he fell down unconscious and senseless from the impact. His soldiers were very scared by this disaster. They stopped chasing their enemies and picked up Romulus's body, taking it back to the city. Luckily, it was discovered that he was not seriously hurt. He quickly recovered from the impact and went back to the fight. 
Another incident that happened during these battles has been remembered in history because it gave a name to a small lake or pool that later became part of the city. In the past, a Sabine general named Curtius met Romulus in a specific area of the battlefield. They fought fiercely for a long time. More soldiers joined the fight, and eventually, Curtius got injured and surrounded by enemies. He ran away to save his life. Romulus followed him for a short distance, but Curtius eventually stumbled upon a small, swampy pool. The pool was formed by water that had been left behind by the river's floods in an old, abandoned channel. It was now covered and almost hidden by mossy and floating plants. Curtius ran quickly and didn't pay attention to where he was going. He fell into a hole and sank into the water. Romulus thought Curtius would drown there, so he left to find another enemy. However, Curtius managed to crawl out of the pond he fell into. The pond was later called Lake Curtius to remember this event. The name stayed for many centuries, even after the water disappeared and the place was filled with streets and houses. The fights between the Romans and the Sabines lasted for many days. Throughout this time, the Sabine women, who were the reason for this terrible quarrel, were extremely worried and upset. They loved their fathers and brothers, but they also loved their husbands, too. It made them very sad to think that every day the people they loved were fighting and hurting each other, and they couldn't do anything to stop it. Eventually, after enduring a lot of hardship for several days, a critical moment came when they realized they could intervene. Both sides had grown to read of the struggle. Neither could defeat the other, but neither was willing to give in. The Sabines couldn't accept such a humiliating choice of either leaving Rome and abandoning their daughters and sisters to the captors, or staying and giving up on their plans to rescue them. And the Romans couldn't take those who, regardless of their past, were now living happily as wives and mothers in their own homes in the city and hand them over to an army of invaders who were demanding them with threats and violence without great dishonor. Therefore, even though there was a break in the fighting and both sides were tired of it, neither was ready to give up. Both were getting ready to go back into the battle with more determination and energy. The Sabine women believed they could help. Hercilia, a prominent woman, suggested and organized a plan. She gathered her fellow countrywomen and explained that they should all go together to the Roman Senate. Their goal was to ask for permission to intervene and advocate for peace between the warring nations. The women, accompanied by their young children, went together to the Senate chamber and requested to be allowed inside. The doors were opened and they entered. They all seemed to be very upset and worried. Their grief and anxiety from the ongoing war persisted, and they pleaded with the Senate to permit them to go to the Sabines' camp and try to convince them to make peace. The Senate agreed. The women wanted to bring their children along, but some Romans were worried that they might use the excuse of seeking peace to actually escape from Rome. Therefore, it was decided that they should leave their children behind as hostages, except for those who had two children who were allowed to bring one. This strategy was believed to help them appeal to their Sabine relatives. The women, accordingly, left the Senate chamber. They had their children in their arms, their hair was messy, their robes were untidy, and their faces were pale with sadness. They walked sadly in a procession out through the gate of the city. They crossed the plain and moved towards the citadel. They were allowed to enter, and, after waiting for some time, they were brought into the council of the Sabines. Here, they started crying again and expressing their grief with loud exclamations. When things became quiet again, Hercilia spoke to the leaders of the Sabines. She asked them to stop the war on behalf of her and her companions. She said that they knew the war was being fought because of them, and they could see that the Sabines loved them based on everything they had done. However, now their actual needs demanded that the war be ended. It's true that when the Romans first took control of us, we felt very mistreated. However, after accepting our situation, we have now grown accustomed to our new homes and are happy and satisfied with them. 
We love our husbands and children, and everyone treats us with kindness and respect. So please, don't try to separate us again out of misplaced sympathy or continue this terrible war. Although it's supposedly for our sake, it's actually making us incredibly unhappy. This meeting had the expected effect. The Sabines and Romans quickly began peace talks, and it is easy to make peace when both parties genuinely want it. In fact, there was a significant change in attitude, so much so that the intense hostility between the two nations transformed into a friendly sentiment. Eventually, a treaty was made to unite the two nations. It was decided that the two nations would be combined into one. The Sabine territory would be added to Rome's territory, and Titus Tadius, along with the main Sabine leaders, would move to Rome, which would become the capital of the new kingdom. In short, there has never been such a sudden and complete reconciliation between two warring nations. With the echoes of the Sabine War still resounding, we've witnessed the strategic might of Romulus and the heartening reconciliation brought forth by the Sabine women, culminating in a union that forever altered the course of Roman history. As we draw this chapter to a close, the story of Rome's founding is far from over. If you're eager to see how the tale of Romulus and the city he built concludes, join us for the next chapter, The Conclusion. To continue with us on this historical odyssey, click on the upcoming video or follow the link in the description below. If this journey through Rome's legendary past has captivated you, please subscribe to Alexandria for more historical narratives. Like this video to show your support and share it with those who cherish the lessons of history. We thank you for your company in the Sabine War, and we invite you to join us as we approach the finale of this epic saga. Until next time, may the valor and wisdom of the ancients inspire you in the present.